Okay. Uh, so let's begin. So uh, have you guys uh, started a programming assignment? Anyone started? Oh, okay. So we have actually these, uh, three TAs, you know, available. So and then the uh, you guys already know that they are office hours, right? So you you know you can uh, set an appointment or you can go to uh, their office hours and get help. Uh, and then if this is the first assignment, so somehow you know you spend more time to get familiarized with this kind of programming. Because from the second one, getting more difficult. Okay, <laughs> so no, it's actually this is based on the feedback that I received for two years. The uh, so what happened is that you know especially this you know the telecom, a lot of people from non-programming background. So um, half of them oh they just learn start learning Python, and how I'm supposed to do I'm mean, implementing my own web server with caching and all different things, even they don't know uh, what exactly that means. So, but I actually pushed it for two years, but, uh, but I got you know, lots of good feedback. So starting with some simple one, so this is a very simple one compared to what you will do uh, at the end. And also I'm, I'm sure because when you apply some kind of jobs or your internships, they actually require something different from others, right? So this project, if you do well, then you actually can talk about a lot, okay? So, and spend more time on that, okay? And unfortunately, again, so problem set will be out today. So that only have one week to complete. Okay, we have a 10, I don't know, 10 or 11 questions, but uh, it's 100 point. And also there's a one left. This uh, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, in case anyone that who cannot really meet this, you know, Friday and Saturday, so we have additional labs. You actually can do, you know, lab one and lab two in these additional labs, but uh, you will be more difficult because you are only one, right? Because in case that you do it uh, this time, you will have a group of two people, right? Two people in a group. So you can work together, can solve it. But if you do it in additional lab, then you have to do it by yourself, right? So that's the thing. Any question? Yeah. Can I ask, does anyone still need a partner for, for the lab this weekend? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have some uh, scheduling system, right? In the D12. That I heard. I haven't checked it, but uh, we have uh, some scheduling system in Doodle, uh, D12, and then you can sign in. No? Oh, okay. So I will check with the, my TAs and then yeah, I'll let you know. If not, then because we don't have many students, so even you know, exchanging email may work too. Okay. Okay. So any, any questions? Okay, so let's do it. Uh, so Eden is switching today. So today's you know, uh, goals, we understand uh, three different uh, networking equipment or technologies. You might hear a lot of times that you know, repeaters and hubs, bridges and switches, routers, you know, so we will you know, tackle on one of, you know, all of this. And router that we will learn more in the later uh, lectures. And also, the, uh, there are some different uh, switching protocols and mechanisms. So we, one important thing is, you know, self-learning of this switch. So when you install the switch, how, you know, that switch automatically for the packet, right? And then about the, how about the, when you, you know, connect the multiple switches and somehow you didn't know the entire net network and you may mess up the network, but somehow it actually prevent. So that is a spanning tree protocols. We also will talk about it today. And also virtual lens. Okay. 
So, okay, you have a set of machines like this. So how you can uh, let them communicate? All of them can communicate with each other. How you can do it? Mesh. 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 Yeah, so there's one way you can do meshing. Then what you need? Okay, each computer needs one, two, three, four, five links to all, all the other machines. And then deep, this network getting bigger and bigger, you need infinite number of you know, the uh, lines, right? Can you think of any you know, other way other than this meshing? Star. Okay, star. So then you have a one connection, you know, from the center. So you have a one, right? Yes. That's true. And then also you can do this way too. Thanks. Is a ring. So in case that when you send the packet, because all the other machine can listen, and then uh, when so because you know the for example the internet we will talk about today is a CSMA. CD. So basically, when you're sending it, you can also can detect there's some kind of collision. Okay. Okay. So it's all about the resource allocation because you have a given resource. How you share that resource with uh, many other nodes. Right. So again, this is three times, three ways to share the media. <laughs> what was it? Partition. So partition the resource. So it's like a FDMA and TDMA okay. and taking turns. Okay. So this is some kind of review. So like using uh, tokens, right? So one uh, cons is uh, some, uh, you know, vulnerable to failures. The last one is Sensitive. What was it? Decentralized. Decentralization. Yeah. So decentralized or random access. Why I'm talking three times here? Because we will talk about this random access map protocol. And then one of the example is Ethernet. Okay? Okay. So then, uh, in case that, okay, so there are, you know, repeaters and hubs, switches and bridges and routers. So you can, three different things, right? So hubs, if you see it, joining broadcast medium. So what this means? Joining broadcast medium. Broadcast from all different propagates. So one broadcast domain. So basically, if you you put the hub here, even though you have a two, three separate networks, all three are under the same broadcast domain. Which means, any of the machine here sending it, then their machine here will sense it, right? Because collision detection, because there carry a sense. When you send it, this guy carry a sense. Why? Because this hub, you know, let let them join the broadcast medium. How they do? Whenever that it sees some packet here, it broadcasts to the another two lines. Okay? Whenever that it sees some packet here, broadcasts to the another line, right? then hub could be very useful when you do some network debugging. So in case that you have uh, some network like this, so for example, the, we have a network in this room, another room, and another room, and then somehow it's uh, not many you know, computers, so they decided to use hub. Then basically means if you connect your computer to hub, you can see all the packet passing through the network, and then you can easily can debug and then also can check the, some kind of conformance and etc. Okay, because basically it forecast. What would be the disadvantage of this using hub? One one. One. So one collision domain, which means what? Only one device can collisions. Only one can load. One yeah. device but at once. Too much traffic. Yeah. Okay, too much traffic. Then what? Then just Your throughput, right? <laughs> So as many no nodes increase, your throughput actually getting dropped because, <coughs> you know, when each node is sending it, any other node in the network cannot send it. So basically, you cannot really utilize the all the other users' the uh, transmission capabilities, right? So that's a uh, uh, cons. So which means that some other devices actually solve this issue. That is switch. Okay. 
So here, so breaches and switches is actually exactly opposite, right? Previous one is sharing the you know broadcast domain. <coughs> now it's isolating broadcast medium, which means okay, you have a lot of networks now. If you connect to the hub, then what happened? You have 100 nodes connect to the one hub, and then you know one guy start doing gaming. All other users actually suffer. Even they even cannot you know get the connection and etc. Because somehow you put all the computers or machines into one one broadcast domain, you know one single network. So in case that we put the switch here, then what happened? Because isolating, right? So which means Whenever that it communicate, and then so there is a packet here, then only the first time the switch doesn't know where to go, it fall to the all the other lines. Just one packet, okay? One packet. Now <coughs> switches know that where that packet come from. After learning is done, then always just sending it to the you know each interface where the destination is located. Okay, so that way is actually isolating the broadcast medium. So what would be the advantage? So more efficient use of the network resource, right? Is the exact opposite of the hubs. And then now you can construct really large networks without worrying about this, you know, broadcast packet everywhere, right? And another advantage, so because the, this hub is basically just copying from the physical layer. So you see the signal, and then you're just copying into the another, you know, the port. But this one, because now you have some kind of learning capability, right? So it actually can do some kind of protocol conversion. So for example, you have <coughs> Ethernet, or you have a, you know, wireless. You even can communicate between wireless and then the Ethernet, you know, using bridges. Actually, basically almost similar to switches. So, because it does some processing, okay? Okay, so any question in these two? Okay, then, I, okay, Ethernet, so, I mean, we use, you know, every day. So it's a dominant LAN technology. So now, I think it, you know, because from one meg, 10 gigabit PS, and then now maybe, you know, getting up to 40 gig and 100 gig, and things like that. So it's getting uh, more efficient. And if you see, because the Ethernet frame is a layer two, right? So layer two, it needs what? Yeah, address and the MAC address, right? You need a hardware address. So, so even here, destination address, this is a MAC address. Okay, destination MAC address, source MAC address, and then also you need a data. And you also need a CRC because in Lincoln layer, what it does? Framing, delimiting, and then error correction. So that's why it's a CRC. And then also there could be a lot of different, you know, frame, right? Layer two packet. So you have to identify, oh, this is either a packet or this is HDLC packet, right? You remember the HDLC 011111? So it identify, oh, this is the HDLC. So we did uh, some kind of stopping, right? to make sure that your data doesn't have any occurrence of the, your header. So this is the same. So Ethernet has its own preamble. That is some you know, different combination so that you know that, oh, this is an Ethernet address. And source and destination, it is a six byte source and destination. I think you guys all know, but uh, to make sure. <laughs> So if you run the command from your computer, so like, uh, for example, on Windows, IEP config, and then Mac or Linux, IF config, then you can see, okay, there's an adapter. Uh, so there's IP, okay, 1.1.1.1, something like that. And then there's an adapter address, and 0, 0, A, B, some combination, so 6. Three, four, five, six. So you could see it like this. So this is the MAC address. Okay. So then, then how you know that you know? Okay, the how many computers you are connected, and then how many computers in, you know the MAC address you know. Then you may type like ARP minus A. 
then it will show, you know, all the you know, IP address with this associated with the MAC address. Okay, so that is uh, your computer actually learned from the network. Okay. Yeah, I mean, sure, this is also best effort for sure. So, either than actually use a CSMA CD, right? Collision detection. So, carrier sense multiple access. So, you know, while doing sensing the carrier and, you know, offering multiple access, and there also collision detection. So, before sending it, you know, just to see whether the, uh, the link is either or not. And then collision detection is you, when you are transmitting, you basically can know that there are some other packet coming because you have some kind of you know, change in your, uh, some kind of voltage, for example. So then you know, no collision, sure. Transmission complete, collision, then you abort and sending you know, uh, gem signal, and et cetera. And when there is some uh, collision happens, then it actually waits for random time before you know, retry. And then, the, and then, for example, you have, you know, we have 100 users here. And then when one user starts transmitting, another one got the collision. Then uh, you, know, you don't know, right, how many users actually uh, that has a collision. So you need to some kind of random to make sure that you all you can have some kind of chance. So for example, only one user, maybe just back up one time and then try. But if you have a more user, they should back up different time so that you know channel could, could be fully utilized, right? What if all the users back up the same time and transmitting is another collision, another collision, and things like that? So that's why it actually choose randomly from uh, some windows, and then they choose when they will send it. So this approach will work. Is, does, does it work? You know, when there are lots of users in the network or not? There are many users. This you know, approach will work well or not? No, right? When there are many users, partitioning approach actually works well, right? TDMA or FDMA or, you know, variation of this. So that's why some research, I mean, I think it's not long time ago, you know, five to 10 years ago. So there are lots of some mega, you know, MAC algorithm actually the combining this is TDMA and also CSMA CD. So what it actually works. So based on this observation, if you design the protocol that okay, there are not many users, then we try to use a CSMA CD because not many users CSMA CD works well. But now you detect more users in the system, then now you become more like TDMA scheduling. That actually the, uh, get the you know benefit of the both approaches. So there are you know multiple uh, the approaches like that. Okay. So then when you talk about the internet, that we usually say, oh, okay. So there is some kind of length limitation. So internet cable only could reach two kilometer or something like that. And there also packet size should be bigger than 64 byte. I don't need to memorize it. Definitely, it's not really important. But why then, you know, this limitation? Why? So this is so. Suppose that there is a sender A and then a receiver D. It's not. I mean, both can be sender. So there, you know, there is a latency between these two. So when it send it, it takes time D to reach B. Okay. So then, okay, when A send the packet, is you know time T. Okay, and then it takes time, and then T plus D, she can see there is a packet, right? But what if right before T plus D, she's sending the packet, and then now collision happens, right? And then that one travels here, right? And then A, no, oh, there is a collision. So it takes T 
plus 2d time to detect. Okay? So there is, now we know that there is a, the two, t plus 2d time. And then, so A definitely need to wait for the 2d to detect the collision. And also, the, when you're sending it, right, you somehow need to grab the channel in order to detect the collision, right? Because if you are not sending it, you definitely cannot detect. Because when you're sending it, you are grabbing the, grabbing the channel and you also listen. So that's why there is some you know, number of bytes you have to fill in this medium, right? So that's why there's some maximum length you know, around you know, 2.5 kilometer and then minimum length is around the 64 bytes. But in fact, if you really calculate this one, the, uh, this byte is actually much less than 64. But because of the header, you know, different protocol header and things like that, so they define, okay, minimum packet size is a 64, okay? Yeah, you may try to calculate with a bandwidth delay product and things like that. Okay, so now going back to the, this, you know, first one. So there are two, you know, repeaters and the hubs, right? So repeaters running on physical layer. So what it does is, okay, when you're sending the data, because your data is a digital, and then you, you know, convert it to analog, and then you're sending it, right, like this. And because it travels, that your signal, you know, the uh, attenuate, right? So repeater, what it does, just amplify this attenuate data, so that when it reaches to the, you know, receiver, it actually can, uh, you know, identify, okay, this is the zero and one. Basically, it's just amplifying the attenuate data. So this is what uh, physical layer repeater does, and Hubs is very similar. It actually copies the packet and then put it into the another uh, lines. So there are some other, you know, the functionality support that you don't need to know. But so it's very similar to repeater because it runs at the physical layer. So for example, you have a, okay, you somehow early, you know, like 10, 20 years ago, you graduate from here, at that time, they might use, mostly use hub because switch was so expensive. Hub was, you know, cheap. So you build a you know, network like this. Okay, I have one division, another division, division. You connect with the hubs like this. And then you don't need to worry about because this is a plug and play, right? Because what it does is a physical layer, you just copy it in order to make sure that your, you know, one network you know, expanding to the multiple networks. So it's actually plug and play. You just plug, automatically works. Because the operation is very simple. Whenever you see the packet, just broadcast. Whenever you see the packet, broadcast, right? So then this guy can finally reach it to the, uh, another guy in the uh, different networks. So this is a, some Linksys router. If you purchase some router like this, and there is a one Omlink, and there are lots of you know the uh, port, eight port. So Omlink you connect to the, your cable, you know the uh, uh, receiver or the uh, DSL, and you typically connect your computer to here, and then expecting that your computer's uh, you know packet all copy to the other port, so that you actually can detect your uh, printer and all different devices. So why then they use uh, this hub? Because it was a chip. You know, if we, they can use switch, much better, but may not be that you know economical. Because you know, at home, how much you can use, right? If you run this some um, small office with lots of, I mean medium office with lots of people, definitely this is not a good choice. But at home, you or maybe you know, a couple of people use the internet, maybe not. And 
Then what are the limitation of these, you know, repeaters and hubs? One thing that we already mentioned, throughput. Yeah. So one large shared link, right? You have a lot of, you know, different networks connect with the uh, hubs. You know, each bit sent everywhere, which means the aggregate uh, throughput is very, very limited. And another one is cannot support multiple LAN technologies because it is very dumb. Just copy it and then, you know, put it into another line, which means it cannot really support multiple different technologies. Like you have a Wi-Fi, you have just Ethernet or a difference that you definitely cannot copy to another line for sure, right? So that does not support multiple LAN technologies because it doesn't do any uh, the processing, intelligent processing. And I mean, certainly that, you know, be, because of the limited throughput, limitation on maximum node and distance. So that's the uh, issue. So now, let's see the switchings. So link layer, so physical layer is what? Is that repeaters and hubs. Link layer breaches and switches. So breaches and switches connect two or more lengths at the link layer. Okay, link layer is primo, source MAC, destination MAC, and data and CRC, right? And what it does, okay, extract the destination address from the frame. So it does some kind of software processing, okay? Extract the destination address from the frame and then look up the destination in a table and forward. So it looks like hard, but it's like this, okay? So yeah, I may explain a little bit. So here, so when the host, this host, oh, this host, okay, A is sending some packet to B, okay? So initially, so it has a switch. Switch doesn't have any memory of where A or B is located, okay? When A is sending it, okay, I wanna send, you know, this is the packet for B. Because it doesn't have any entry, what? because it doesn't know flood. It flood to B, C, D. And then also adding the entry that, oh, A is in the uh, interface one. Now it knows that, okay, A is in interface one. Whoever sending to A, I will not flood. I will send to, you know, interface one. So what happened, okay, A sending to B, then now, okay, the, this switch has an entry the interface one, you know, A is in interface one. And then B, sending technology back, then what happens is that, okay, switch, look at, okay, destination is A, and then, oh, destination A is in port one. So you will send it. So this is how it works. If it doesn't have anything, I mean, it doesn't have an entry, flood. It has an entry, it only sending to the de destination. And then another one, when this guy is sending it, right, it will not flood to itself. It actually exclude the port. It the uh, exclude the port that the you know that packet came from. Okay. So any question? I mean, we will talk more. There are some examples as well. So bridges and switches, you know, using this method that isolate the traffic, right? So, for example, you have a, you know, three different networks. If you have a switch in between, then basically you the, uh, confine one broadcast domain into each network. Then definitely could be used in many different places, right? So this, it, I think, in a 48 port switch is very popular, and then now it's actually very cheap as well. So it's like this. So you have a rack, you have lots of computers, so, you know, in the data center, right? You have lots of computers, and then you have a switches on the top of rack. So we call it top of rack switch, okay? So you can think this is, you know, kind of one network that with one switch, and then there are other racks, right? You also have, a, you know, a lot of servers, you have a top of rack switch, a lot of servers, top of rack switch, you connect it like this, okay? So then, 
like this, right? You have larger racks, you have a toggle rack switch, also that one connected either using switch or router, even router that you know, implement just like switch too. Okay, so then, uh, so what are the advantages of switches over hubs and repeaters? So one you know, important thing is only four frames as needed. It doesn't really flood the networks. And also, you can you know, the, uh, extend the you know, geographic span of the networks because even a collision only happens on the one network, right? And the switches actually prevent broadcasting. So that's why that you can extend and also improve privacy because now you cannot do you know, sleeping anymore because it is only for that networks and switches only for whatever relevant to the, uh, the uh, so whatever that it has an entry in the switch, right? So that, that's why you cannot really uh, snooping. If you want to do, you, if you have some management switch, etc., and then you do port metering, okay? Okay, I want to you know mirror whatever packet, you know the appear the you know certain port into here so that I can debug things like that. And also you can use a different technologies because it does some processing. Disadvantage. Yeah, so because you have to do process, because you have to look at the destination MAC address, right? You have to, so you have to identify this is the Ethernet frame, and then you have to read this destination MAC address, and then you put into the table that, okay, this destination MAC address is in, you know, this interface. This destination address is in this interface, like that. So that means, you know, when you do this kind of forwarding, it takes time. So that's the issue, but how they solve it is that you know, cultural switching, which means when you read the packet, when you read the you know, packet as a header, you already start preparing the, you know, the forwarding packet so that it actually doesn't you know, uh, spend time on processing the packet. So that is you know, cultural switching. And also, another one is how we actually make this switch plug and play. Okay, because the you know, hubs was great because physical layer you just copy it. It was really easy to just deploy it. You know, even uh, not a network engineer can do it. How we can make a switch, you know, behave like this? So that is, you know, the self learning. Self learning is just what I explained. So whenever that you cannot find the entry, then you flood, and you find the entry, you just sending to the that interface. So that is self learning. But it's a you know, higher cost for sure. So now the question. So switch versus hubs. Compared to hubs, Ethernet switches support what? Larger. 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 Yeah, so A, larger. And compared to hubs, switches provide A, B, C. 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 Yeah, there is C. A. It's not A. Right? It's not really provide a higher load, right? It, it actually can uh, handle higher load. Okay. okay, now see you know, some details of the, how the salt learning works. So here is, okay, when a frame, just this example, right? Okay, when A is sending frame, and then there is a switch connecting all you know, four computers here. And then when you know a frame arrives, then okay, inspect the source MAC address because A is identified by source MAC because it's a link layer. Link layer only knows MAC address. MAC address. Okay, so then MAC address is okay. Oh, source MAC address A is a source MAC address is from this interface. Just you know, assume that this interface is one. Okay, A from interface one associate, and then store the mapping, mapping in the forwarding table. So now the table has, okay, source A is in interface one, okay? 
And then, so there are some frame arrives, but the, there is an you know, unfamiliar destination, which means that there is no entry in the table. Then what it does, it forward to all the other computers, not to itself, okay, all three. This way, that B, C, D will receive the packet, right? And then after one time, may not, you know, broadcast anymore, right? So if you write up, you know, this software code like Python, it's like this. So basically, if you find some destination MAC address from the table, sure, the you, uh, okay, so if you entry found, then you have to forward, right? But if the you know, entry is from the, where the frame arrived, you, you, you have to discard. And then all the other cases, you flood, right? Yeah, basically this code is, a, you know, what I just explained, okay? So now let's see there's some example. Okay, it looks like, you know, not complicated, but let's, let's see. Okay, so uh, there is a either switch or bridges in between, you know, four computers. And then now you sending a frame to Z, okay? Z is a MAC address. Then what the layer two bridge or switch does, okay, source address from you from originating in interface one, right? And then, okay, so be, before, you know, the next slide, then what happened? Okay, so you originating in interface one, then what it does? And so it's new and Flood, right? D. So it flood to here. Okay, now, okay, so now that we send something to you, okay, because you send it, so now I know that you is in interface one, now V is sending acknowledge back, oh, V is here, in fact, okay, <laughs> V is sending acknowledge back to you, Okay, then you will receive it. And then also breach it, also <coughs> will receive it, right? Because it's a shared medium. So then, oh, okay, V also in the interface one. Right? Okay, so then another question is that, you know, because V, so you hear, right? Breach, forwarding action is not, why? Already Same interface? It came from there it and it won't send back, it will drop the package. Okay. Because, you know, the, uh, okay, so here, that exactly, you know, that answer. Because you already have a U is in the table, right? And then, uh, because now, okay, look up the table and then, okay, U is in the same interface. So that dropped the package. Okay, so now, G is sent to you, then what happened? Okay, so the current table is UV, is an originating interface one, and then G, when it send it, bridge knows that, okay, this is in, you know, interface two. And since the, uh, already, U is known, right? Forwarding to interface one, right? So if you do it, Again and again, then, you know, basically that uh, this bridge has U, V, Y, Z in its table. So after that, you don't do any, you know, more learning, right? You already have a table. Then there could be some question. Oh, okay, then when I move from here to there, so for example, I have a one switch that I was connected, and then I move to another computer, and then I, you know, plug into the another switch, even though that switch is you know, connected. So how actually this update could happen? Can you think about you know, how you deal with this you know, changing uh, number of, you know, uh, somehow the, I mean, move, you know, host moving from one, you know, one port to another? 
Yes, that's real. Yeah. Address send the packet. Send what? Send the packet. Send the packet. Who send the packet? Computer. Is plugged. Yeah. Computer plugin send the packet. Right. Some packet is sent. So basically, that you know, switch can update. Okay. And then also another one is the uh, there is also the some timer from your computer. Or you know, switches also may you know the uh, remove the, that uh, certain packet after you know some predetermined time. For example, 10 minutes, no activity, then you remove that entry. Also, you may you know remove that entry because your memory is money, so you may not really store a lot of entries there. So whatever that you know the earlier entries, you just you know evict, and then. Uh, you know, put more new entries. Okay. Okay. So then, looks like a really good algorithm because now it's like a plug-and-play may work. But how about this situation? Okay. So somehow I even don't understand the whole campus network. So I actually connected you know two network with one switch, and then also another switch. Even I mean didn't realize because you know in another room. And even I don't know the existence of the one switch, and I added one more. Then what happened is that, okay, when I sent it, because I couldn't find any, uh, any destination here, flood, and then this guy also couldn't find it, flood, looping. So this is actually the, uh, it's really serious because. From interface one to interface two, will the bridge update its Mac table? Yeah. Okay. Because you know when you move it, you will send some packet. Okay. If you don't send packet, then certainly that this uh, bridge thinks you know you are in port A, port one. So it will rewrite the previous with the new. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So how about you know you handle these loops? Because this is a layer two, which means this happened really quickly. You have infinite number of packets and you know flood in the network, and then a lot of you know campus network down, <laughs> things like that. So if you just use a switch without any you know software running, then this will happen. This will definitely will happen. <coughs> you can actually really can try. But there is some, you know, software that uh, algorithm that Switch is using. We call spanning tree protocol. So that actually prevent this from happening. So the solution is a spanning tree. So in the computer science, there are many different data structures, and then one of thing is spanning tree. So spanning tree, the definition is, is a subgraph that covers all, you know, vertices, but contain no cycles, okay? So you have a whole different. Uh, we will see some different, you know, topologies, and you have. So like this. So and then you, you want to make sure that it, it, you know, from the root, you always can reach it to any of the node. So which means it has to cover all the boxes, but there is no loop. So then you can think of, okay, this one could be like this, and like this, like this, like this, like this, right? Or like this. So you don't have any loop, right? Things like that. So this is a spanning tree. Okay, so then when the, uh, I think it is one woman actually made this spanning tree protocol. So when she had this problem, and then, oh, what I could use? Okay, there is some data structure that actually really good for this problem. Oh, okay, spanning tree protocol. Now how we actually can implement? And then also, you want to make sure that the switch is the plug and play, meaning that it doesn't have any central controller to control all the switches which means from each switch, it should work. 
So we usually call this kind of you know approach is a distributed algorithm. Okay? So you know each each you know either a system just run based on its local policy. It doesn't have any global policy. It only has a local policy. And then each one just behaves based on the local policy. But after all the you know the operation, then globally it goes to the optimal. So that is a distributed algorithm. There is another one, the centralized algorithm is basically you have some central controller and then decide, okay, you have to use this path, this path, that path, and things like that. That means if you have a really big network, and then if you want to expand the network, you always need to you know, talk to central manager or central controller to you know, define the path. And then it may not really automatically work, right? So that's why the, many of the, you know, the uh, internet protocols or this layer two approaches all distributed algorithms. Okay, so then now we know, oh, we have to somehow build this, you know, spanning tree out of normal trees. Okay, so, okay, so maybe this case we build like this way so that all the vertices, so all the vertices is your system, right? Your computers. All the vertices covered, but there is also no loop, so that the uh, switch, you don't need to worry about this looping, right? Okay, so then should be distributed algorithm because you know switch cooperate and build you know auto adapt on there are some failures and things like that. So one idea is a how, you know, because if you see this kind of root, the uh, spanning tree, you always need a, some root, and then you build it without any loop, right? So how you make sure that, you know, you know the, uh, there is a, some root. So whenever that, you know, the manufacturer, the manufacturer this switch, it has unique number, okay, switch ID. So there is unique number, and then switches elect the unique number, I mean, root, which is the smallest ID. So for example, one switch has 100, another switch is 99, then 99 is root. If you have another switches with a 98, becomes root. If you have one switch with a zero, always root, right? Because when you manufacture, it's like a serial number. You have unique numbers, okay? So that way, you always can find root bridge. And then, so okay, now you know the root. And each node, it computes the distance to the root. Okay, my distance to root is what? One hop. I, I'm just one hop away from the root. And then this guy receives some message from this guy. Okay, I'm the one hop away from the root. Oh, then I'm the two hop away. Because link layer is only for between link, right? So it doesn't really propagate into multiple links because it is about, you know, make layer. You only, you know, communicate between two ends here. And then these guys also listen. Oh, okay, this guy is a two hop away. I'm the three hop away. And this guy, also one, two, three, right? But somehow, this guy also connected, so this guy will tell this guy, oh, I'm four hop away. And then another guy saying, I'm three hop away. Then I select the three hop away one. That way, you always have shortest and spanning tree to the root, okay? So then, we just, you know, so notation just like, okay, we have a root y here, and the distance, so, you know, from x, from x to y, the distance is d, okay? This is a root, this is my cell, this is the distance, okay? This message, each node sending it, okay? So then how it actually can build the, you know, final topology, we can see. Okay, so initially, because it's a distributed algorithm, each one of node, edible times, I'm the root, I'm the root. You, you say you're the root, 
Okay, everyone's saying the under root. So under root means, okay, under root x, myself is root, from me, distance is zero. So everyone advertise with x o x. So okay, my number, you know, I'm x, so number is five, five zero five. Advertise. Six, six zero six, advertise, right? Then all those messages arrived, whoever that, you know, connected to the, that uh, node, right? Then what happened is like this. So one example. So here, you know, everyone anyway sending it as uh, I'm the root. So 101, you know, 303, 505, 204, uh, two, two. and then let's see the, you know, the number four case. Okay, it's sending 4, 4. You know, 4, 4 to 2 and 7, right? So 2 and 7 are connected. So 2 and, two and 7 will receive 4, 4. And then, and then also, because when, because it's switch 4 also sending it, also switch 4 also receive from these two guys, right? So, okay, switch 4 hears from 2 that 2 or 2. Because, you know, this guy is saying, I'm the root. And this guy is saying, I'm the root. But compare the you know, ID, 2 and 4, 2 is lower. Oh, okay, you are the root. So he's saying, oh, you are the root. Then, after that, what he has, so from me, 4, to root is 2, distance is 1, right? And after that, building that information, sending that information to 7, okay? So that, this is how it works. Okay? And also, you know, when you send, okay, also switch 4, here's from 7, that uh, 217, at some point it will be saved 217, is that, okay, so the uh, root is 2, and then the, from me, distance is 1. Okay? So then, okay, because, you know, I already received from 2 that there is a, just a zero, right? Because it, from me, it's a just a one. But now, this guy is saying, oh, I'm, you know, to the two, I'm the, uh, you know, one of the way, which means if I choose this path, I will be, the distance is two. So it actually disconnect, because for the same root, you know, minimum, right? If you do this process, then, you can think of, you know, the whole, this process from all different nodes. So basically what happened is that, you know, lowest number becomes the root, and all the others build the shortest path toward the root, right? So for example here, okay, switch to, at some point, the here, 113 from 3. Okay, 3 because, you know, at first time, 3 might sending 3 or 3, and 1 also sending 101, and then exchange information, oh, you are the root and then build this 113. So sending to whoever connected, right? So it will send to two. Then two, uh, oh, okay, because root is one, right? Root is, this is root. Root is smaller than myself, so now the root is one, and then build a one, two, two, right? And the things like that. So after all, that you have a two paths with a different, you know, distance, you cut, and then finally, it, you know, creates the spanning tree so that removing all the, you know, loops in the networks. Okay. So any question? Uh, this is very simple, but certainly that you know that this is so important. So you could see uh, in the the problem set and also in the midterm for sure. So any question? I will show you one example then. Let's see. As you could see from the uh, slide, but uh, some example like this. Okay, so there is a network like this, and then there is a LAN, is a, you know, host is actually connected to the LAN, and then you have whole different bridges here. So which one could be root? B1, right? So B1 is now the root, and then it builds, you know, based on the B1, right? After all this process, then finally, there is a link that it actually cut, 
Okay? It cut. So basically, you have, okay, so all the lens actually reachable because even lens 1, lens A, is not reachable through this one, but is reachable through here, right? Things like that. So it's like the same, same cases, but this is some more complex scenario. Because, you know, if you think about, okay, so different rooms have a whole different connection with, you know, switches. Could be much more complex, right? But if this uh, spanning tree protocol will work and then cut the link, which, you know, create a loop, okay? So we will have this uh, exercise in the uh, problems that you will see uh, today. Okay. V3 talk. <coughs> which one? V3? Yeah. So actually good question. V3 and V3. So in case the V3 has any LAN connected and there are some hosts, sure. You know, we shouldn't cut this one, right? But here, this example, we assume that <coughs> there is no LAN, that there is no host. That means you even not really providing any connectivity. In case that B has a, some host connected, sure, it should not cut this one. We do connect. Okay. okay, so, and then finally, is a virtual LAN. So all the days, so here, right, switches is good. I mean, you just connect it, and then you, you can communicate. And then without any loop, that's good too. You plug and play and you can use it. But one issue is that, okay, all the days you could do it. And then what happened you know, these days is, okay, you have you know, different teams, like okay, engineering team, research team, executive teams. So they use you know, different switches, for example. And then they sit you know, differently. And initially it was okay. Okay, second floor, third floor, fourth floor. And then some kind of reshuffling or restructuring and then some, you know, executive team becomes, okay, then they have to move it because, you know, current network topology only supports second, third, fourth with a different, you know, the, their role. But you may, you know, create some team like Google. Okay, I have a one manager. I have, you know, one engineer. I have a one researcher working together. And then they may be located in the different rooms. How we actually provide this kind of logical connection of the you know users or the systems, so that is basically the what virtual LAN provides. So virtual means so LAN, right? You provide some kind of switching capability. So virtual means that now you accommodate this kind of logical you know arrangement. Okay. So let's see. So then, like this. Okay, we have whole different teams, you know, located in different uh, rooms. And then, okay, there are three people in the yellow team, and then there are one people here, then, you know, red team, and a whole red team in another building, and things like that. So, I mean, using just an existing switch, you cannot really provide, right? Because if you are in the same land, means you are in the same broadcast domain. If you are in different, you are in different domains, so that you know, you cannot skip any packet from the executive team because if you are in the engineering team, right? So it's like because it provides security switch. So how we actually can provide? So any idea? Because, you know, you learned that you've been using LAN for a while and you could see this some need, right? Because people moving around and then restructuring and then downsizing and whole things happen, and then your network always need to recabling all the time because oh, this is a, you know a tailor. Oh, okay, so he's now in an executive team. He was promoted, you know, connected. It's a mess up, right? How you actually can provide this kind of logical uh, connectivities? And add, you can make different, assign different tags to different teams on layer two. So exactly. So you actually you know give a different tag into different teams. For example. The yellow team always have a yellow tag in the Ethernet frame. So you, you remember, right, Ethernet, Frimbo, and, you know, source and destination map, right? You have one more, one more tag there that, in fact, indicating, you know, your uh, color, for example. Number one, number two, things like that. Then this is not really Ethernet standard, right? Which means, your switch need to 
take the, this tag off when it, you know, departs the network and then connect to the, uh, goes to the host. Okay? So for example here, when you're sending it, so these guys will put red tag in your packet, and then when it reaches, or oh, it already identified, okay, this is for red tag. So it's only sending to the uh, machine with the red tag. Okay? And then also need to take off the that tag. So then, in order to, you know, making VLAN works, so, you know, this, you know, VLAN color per interfaces or VLAN color per MAC addresses. So, so the, which means that you have a, you know, a whole port, you know, 48 port. You can either assign, okay, this is red based on the port. So we call this port-based VLAN. So if you use some kind of Cisco devices, command line interface, set VLAN, okay, so set VLAN, you know, the VLAN name, some name with, okay, port one, two, three, four is, you know, one VLAN. Another is a port. So that is port-based VLAN. This is also very useful because you only need to connect to the that, you know, port then automatically work, or as long as you know it, you just change the setting. Okay, this 135 is now team 1 instead of 1, you know, 9, 10. So you can change it. <coughs> Much easier way, maybe, source MAC address. Because you have a computer, you already have a source MAC address. It doesn't change. Your source MAC is already, you have a laptop, you register the, compu you know, the company. Company already knows, oh, this source MAC is, you know, someone's laptop or desktop. Already know it. So you're actually mapping this source MAC address to the different color that you can achieve it. So we call this it's a uh, MAC, MAC based VLAN, something like that. Okay. So basic idea is that you're actually adding you know, one VLAN tag field and the switches putting and then taking off. Okay. So then there are a couple of things, right? So okay, traffic isolation. Hub and repeater doesn't provide, right? Breach and switches, sure. IP router, sure, too. We even didn't learn. And the plug and play, yes, because it's physical layer, you just copy it. Breach and switches, yeah, because of the, this, you know, learning, right? Self learning. So, but IP router, you have to set something because you have to set some IP address and things like this now. And efficient routing is about all these, you know, about routers. Okay, so this is the first one. Uh, what's the time? Six, ten. <sighs> okay, ten minute break. <laughs> is that? I mean, ten minute break is okay, or we just finish early? Finish early. Finish, finish, finish early. Finish early? Yeah. Don't break. Break. That's the break. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the the only time that I can do lab is Okay, uh, let's begin. So another topic is about the uh, wireless networks. So in order to understand the wireless networks, let's see the wireless links. So you know, as you know that you know, the wireless includes mobile networks as well as you know, the Wi-Fi networks and some kind of licensed band or so, unlicensed band, right? If you see some of the uh, worldwide cellular subscribers, I think a lot now. It's, uh, you know, 2009, it was more than 4 billion, which means, you know, 2016, you can imagine then how many, right? And also, a lot of the uh, devices, including laptops, and, you know, having Wi-Fi interfaces built in, right? So like laptops and PDAs and cell phones and is getting more popular. So even you may not have any Ethernet card, uh, so you may have just wireless interfaces. So 
you know, wireless is actually different from wires uh, because there's, you know, more source of the some corruption compared to wired. So, for example, when you run, you know, the uh, microwave, your Wi-Fi connection got impacted. So you may not have any, you know, packet sent or packet corrupted around that time. Or so, you know, interference because of the other computers or other uh, your the uh, smartphones. There's some interference too. So that means that you may have more bit errors. And also, there is multipass the uh, propagation. So when even you know I, I'm sending something, it doesn't really go straight. I mean, sure, there are some signal will go straight, and there are other signal will reflect it from the world and then arriving uh, at the same destination. So some of the project that I'm, do, I'm doing, they figure out the where the signal comes from. So when you move, like you know, motions, then you have some static paths as well as some moving paths. How you actually can the decompose this signal to figure out the what kind of motion you are doing. So uh, that also possible. Uh, so there are many things like that. So there are multipath propagation, and also broadcast medium. Like when you sending something, some of you can sense. It's not all of you, depending on your transmission rate. So you affect others only to the certain distance. So in the Ethernet, right? You are in the same broadcast domain. Yeah, sure. Everyone can hear. But in the wireless, it only cover only certain number of people, right? Depending on the distance. So if you are sending it, maybe you know the person at the end may not receive it. Even even sensing the channel, you may not see anything. Right. So that the uh, to everyone, but it's not uh, you know depending on your uh, transmission range or or things like that. Okay. So okay, wireless link. There is a high bit error rate, right? M more, you know, the source of the interference, and and also when you're sending the signal to another, that decreasing your signal strength when you're sending it. So if you want to sending data, uh, then you have to increase your power and sending it, right? Because that power that decreasing over distance, right? So. And then also attenuate. So this is uh, some, yeah, because of the attenuation over distance. And another one is interference from other sources. So when you're sending it, you know, you're chatting, you basically interfere others, right? Interfere others. So for example, you know, the you have some a to the 11 or you know, in the same channel. Basically, you are competing that channel. So radio source in the same frequency band. So for example, 2.4 gig, you know, wireless phone interfere with 8 to the 11 because it's the same, you know, frequency range, right? And also, you know, microwave oven, you run it, it actually interferes. So there were, you know, lots of paper, I think around 10 years back, there are lots of paper measuring <laughs> What's the impact of you know microwave, you know when you communicate? So uh, there were lots of you know measurement paper on that. And then okay, so multipath propagation I already told you. So when the uh, transmitter is sending it, so it will have a very strong signal that you know line of sight. And then also other you know signal will reflect from all different the uh, objects and then reach the receivers, right? So then means when you receive it, oh, okay, some kind of, you know, signal, right? You receive from the multiple, multiple paths with some different arrivals, and then it's actually, you can, you, because the original signal is like this, because of all different signals that what you see is like, oh, it's even you couldn't see it, oh, this is a signal. So you somehow need to decompose all this signal and 
uh, decode the bit, right? So here is that dealing with the bit is actually somehow different because wired, because it, the loss is a pretty low, right? Because when you're sending it, most likely you sense it because it's broadcast. And then also you can, you know, detect the collision too. And then over the one hub that will be routed, you know, using IP packet. So and then if you use, you know, the very uh, like high capacity link and things like that, it's, it's very hard to find, you know, packet losses, for example. So that the, when we design some protocol, that assumption is, okay, there are some product, you know, the, there are some packet losses, then, oh, more like because of other users in the network. So it's more like congestion because of too many packets in the network. So maybe my packet got dropped. So that's my assumption. And the protocol design is based on this assumption, which means, okay, there is a loss because there are too many packets in the network, then what do you have to do? You have to reduce your rate, right? So that's the design. But the wireless, because of the, this all different, like a signal attenuation, multi-pass, and you know, all different source of the interference. So even losses, you cannot really assume that, oh, this is because of congestion. Because it could be some other interference like, node, right? So that, that's why the, some kind of you know, uh, protocol handling on you know, each you know, different networks is somehow different. So for example, so here, okay, there is a high bit error rate. So why are the case? Okay, I have to reduce my sending rate because somehow network is becoming congested. But in case of wireless, oh, okay, so there are some, you know, a lot of noises. I may need to increase transmission power to sending it, right? So that means that you require more energies. And then which means you increase the power, which means you will increase the interference to other nodes. Because now we are reaching more nodes, right? So and then also, high bit error rate, the link layer, you need to do more, right? Link layer, it can do error correction and error detection, right? So then link layer, you may have, a, you know, the link layer retransmission mechanism so that you can the, uh, somehow hide this loss from the entire end-to-end -end pass. So for example, you have a wireless link at the end and all the other is wired. Then somehow you need to make sure that you error recovery between, the, you know, one hub, you know, uh, have efficient as possible, right? So that the link layer retransmission algorithm is much more important for wireless. Okay, so this is basically that uh, explains it. What's the difference? Uh, you know, broadcast is different for wired and wireless, right? Wired, all nodes receive transmissions from all other nodes, right? But the wireless, that because of this situation, okay, I sending something, so this node can sense it. This node sending something, this can sense it, but these two, maybe not, right? So this is, we call hidden terminal problem. Okay, we will see more in detail, okay? So why this happened? Because signal that when you're sending it, signal strength actually, you know, decreases, right? So like this, and then see the signal decrease. So when it reaches here, it even A cannot really sense any of C, and the C also cannot sense any of A. Even though B can sense both of them, right, here. So there are examples, there are a lot. So is there is also Bluetooth also use the same band of Wi-Fi, and then also different Wi-Fi, you know, standard, A to A and B and G, I think is now, you know, most people use N or more. So, and then also there are different cellular 
technologies, 3G, 4G, 5G, and not 5G yet, LTE. So don't need to memorize it because it's not important. So with a cellular, you actually starting from 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. So 5G, 4G is a current, 4G and LTE is a current, you know, standard. And then 5G is the, a lot of research is, uh, activities are actually going on for 5G. Okay. Okay, so wireless links that usually how it actually connected is, okay, you have laptops, you know, cell phones, like this. So we call mobile station. Okay, it's a mobile station. And then you have some, you know, either access point or base station, and then connect to the infrastructure node. So, for example, in the Wi-Fi case, you have a Wi-Fi routers and you have laptops, and then connect to the campus network. Campus network connect to the some level three or you know some AT&T or Verizon, some different the uh, networks, right? In case of cellular, okay, you have a smartphone with the LTE, you have a base station is associated, and then it connects to the, in case of AT&T, AT&T's core backbone, okay? That in backbone, it's accounting how much you, you use data, and based on that, you, it builds, and et cetera, okay? So it's like this, some mobile host or mobile station, that we have, you know, computers and laptops, and also there's some base station or access point that uh, responsible for sending packet, right? Between wireless, between wireless and wired, connecting them together. So this is uh, wireless. And then also infrastructure, it has, you know, a lot of routers and switches so that it actually can forward whatever packet received from the end node to forward to the internet. And then whatever packet received from the internet and forward to the end user, okay? So then typically infrastructure node has a lot of, you know, so for example, when you set, so when your computer using DHCP, so you get the DNS address, uh, anyone doesn't know what is a DNS? Anyone knows the DNS? Okay, so there are some people actually doesn't know. So DNS, we will learn. We will learn later. So basically, when what happened is that okay, your computer get connected. Okay, you just press power button, and then because of your computer already said, oh, I will get the IP address automatically. Okay, so that means, okay, when you first connect it, you will find some DHCP server, you know, around here. And the university has some DHCP server here. And then you will get your IP address and then your DNS server name. So DNS server name is basically, it changed from your IP address to some kind of human readable, like, uh, you know, www.colorado.edu, or that one into, you know, this, uh, IP addresses. So you have that kind of information and then you communicate, right? So infrastructure node actually basically provide that kind of uh, services. DHCP, DNS, and also routing to outside of the world, right? So infrastructure node uh, provide those. And also there is another mode that actually you can do. So your laptop, your laptop, you you just set your IP address, and then you can communicate with your uh, friend's laptop, and then just transmitting and receiving uh, the, some file. So that is, we call at-home mode. It's not infrastructure, so at-home mode. You can communicate between each laptop, okay? And another one is a power save. It doesn't really matter, so, because Basically, what it means, the, uh, there are some node, you know, can go to sleep, then AP can help somehow, you know, buffering some packet and then sending it. So, but it's not important. 
So infrastructure versus ad hoc is, you know, infrastructure node, always you have a, some station, like a base station or access point, you always have it. And then uh, you basically have a, some transitional services through the disconnected you know, network, typically the wired, right? So you have all the this, uh, DNS, routing, and your IP addresses. Ad hoc is more like you, you know, the uh, ad hoc connectivity between each laptop or some devices. Okay, so you can think like, okay, client server is more like infrastructure because the server is one and you have lots of clients, you connect it and they get services, right? So this is more like client server. Ad hoc is more like a peer to peer. You communicate with each peer and then exchange some files and things like that. So we will, we will you know, address all this later on. But, uh, and now let's see some channels and association. So here is a in case, uh, example of the Aero 2011. So we have one, two, three, four, you know, 13. So all different channels running on different frequency, okay? So different frequencies, so frequency you divided resource, right? Partition the resource, right? With the frequency. But if you see here, one and two overlap, three and four overlap, right? So which means if you don't, if you really partition, then you have to use either one and six, 11, even though you have a 13 channel, if you want to have a you know, complete separation, then you only can use three channels, right? So this is the, uh, the typical Wi-Fi. And then what happened is that, okay, so you may have a multiple access point, right? Here and there. And what it does is actually client driven. So access point keep sending beacon frame. Okay, my SSID, see you Boulder, what was it, this guest? Yeah, I cannot remember, so see, guest yeah. something, right? And then, and then ourselves decide, right? Okay, whether I will use a guest network or, you know, see you Boulder, you know, network. So that is the client decide which one to join. But typical choice may be Signal quality, right? If you sense, you know, oh, this one has a better signal, you may connect manually, or your computer, like a MacBook, automatically will select, you know, whatever that has a, you know, best signal quality, for example. Yes. So, yeah, so access point sending SSID uh, with a MAC address so that, you know, whatever that machine can communicate uh, with the access, you know, access point. Why it requires a MAC address? Yeah, you need to know, right? Because you have a one hub, you have one hub connectivity. So you need to know the map, you know, hardware address so that your computer can connect, right? Okay, so then how the mobility works so it's like this. So in case that your router, the providing uh, also DHCP address and things like that, so you are actually associated with a CU border, and another one is also CU border too. But you are somehow, you know, the uh, getting weaker signal from this one and then getting a higher signal from this one, then you automatically associate with this one, right? But you still can maintain your own IP address if you are in the same, uh, somehow, some logical networks. So for example, if you are, you know, you are using here and you move to the other room, you still have connectivity because I don't know what exactly they use, but they, I think they use some kind of layer two breaching. So okay, layer two breaching is what? MAC address, right? You have a MAC address here and then you just automatically moving your MAC address to here, and then you can communicate, right? So L2 breaching, or yeah, I don't think they will use some IP routing, and et cetera, okay?
So I remember that uh, from the last batch, right? So uh, you know, one of the the midterm exam asking what happened when you just opened your laptop, how you are connected and communicate with the the internet server. For example, when you type to Google.com, then what happened? So you just list, you know, one by one step. You know, maybe you know five to ten steps, right? So. And then somehow that you know some interviewers exactly ask that question, so that if you think it's very simple, right? But if you don't understand the from the physical layer to all the way to the you know the IP and DNS, you always miss something. And then the people ask you know that point, right? Oh, why then? How this you know can resolve and things like that. Okay. So when you you know review all this one, that you have to think about. When you connect the network, that what would happen in the wired and the wireless? Wireless, I already told you, right? You have, you know, access point. You decide to select, you know, which you want to connect, and then, but still, you don't have any IP address. Then how that you can get the IP address? You have to think about first, right? So then, okay, then how that access point or server knows that there is a new node that I need to keep an IP address. So those kind of you know questions you always need to think about it, and then you know we actually will go over in the you know next two or three lectures that we will you know have answers there. So think about it. Okay. Okay. So two questions. Loss is primary caused by bit errors. Which one? B, right? Ethernet is what? Wait. Congestion. 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 Okay. Here, all hosts on the subnet see all communication. Which one? A. A. Why not B? Hidden terminal. Hidden terminal. Hidden terminal. So not all hosts on the subnet can see, right? Okay. So. Okay. Let's see, you know, 8 to 11, I the same thing. So you have, you have a different, you know, the networks, and then connect to the internet. As I said, there are some hub or switch or routers connecting between these two, and you can see some SSID from each, right? See you, Boulder. See you, Boulder guest. You have access point, and then connect through some of switches or routers and then getting to the internet, right? So that is typical 11 LAN architecture. So if we see, because this is a link layer, so we already know that Ethernet is a preamble, source, MAC, and destination, right? But the access point, oh, okay, there is an SSID. It actually advertises, okay, this is, uh, my AP is this one. You want to connect, things like that. And also need to tell the host that on oh, my MAC address, right? So that's why this has the, all the information like this. So for example, I, you, ha you don't need to memorize this one because even I don't know whether you know, whoever invented this one even can you know, memorize. <laughs> so <laughs> I, based on their need, they just added you know, field, right? So, so for example, to you know, access point, so you basically you're have your own source address, and then access point has destination, and then also SSID. So things like that. So it's, you know, between different communication, so you need to have uh, some different source and destination field. So don't need to memorize at all, okay? Okay, so now another important thing is, you remember Ethernet is what? CSMA CD. So this wireless is CSMA, CSMA. So it's a, there is a no collision detection. So let's see what that means. Okay, here, channels share the medium. So basically, okay, I can sense it. But that is not really perfect, right? So because of this hidden terminal, this, so you're actually not really sure that 
you know, the you can see all the uh, you know the host in the same uh, shared media, right? So then, how we actually can solve this you know the uh, this hidden terminal problem? So if you see this you know the collision detection, so that is in Ethernet. So how it actually works? Okay, you listen while transmitting, right? And then you can see some, uh, you know, signal. Then, okay, there is some kind of collision happens. And then abort, and then try sending it again, right? So this is how it works. So that's why collision detection. But wireless is collision avoidance, okay? So then CSMA, CA. So wired, CSMA, CD, okay? So what, how you actually avoid them? So that is what we will learn. So there are problems, so okay, because cannot detect all collisions. So that is a, because of hidden terminal and some fading and things like that. So that is a, a difference from the uh, wired. And then also, when you listening while sending it, it actually the hard because when you know, the strength of the received signal is much smaller. So even cannot really detect that there are some other, you know, the uh, host chip in and then try to grab the uh, channel is hard. And if you want to, it's not really impossible. So if you build this hardware, it's so expensive, okay? So that's why that this wireless, this one, we usually call hub duplex. Hmm? You are not receiving it while you are sending it, okay? But you know, current research is more on the field duplex. Or we can do it using multiple antennas and different technologies. But that is you know more further away. So it's a hop duplex. Okay. So Arduino 11 does collision avoidance. How it can do? So that's what we'll hear. Okay. So there is a hidden terminal problems. So there is a A. There is a you know the transmission range is a, you know, this the blue circle. And then B, C, okay? So there is C, it's okay. So it actually can, so when A is sending it, B can sense it, but C cannot. B can sense both of them. C also cannot see A. So this is the, you know, the case. Okay, so A, A and C, can see each other, right? And then it somehow sending packet both to B. Then it's an issue, right? Then, then this one, because of two signals arrived at the same time, it cannot decode, right? One can send 101, another one is 010, and you receive the signal that there is nothing. So for example, this actually cannot really uh, figure out which one send it, right? So then, so that means because of this issue, the this happens, hidden terminal happens, then this one will suffer, right? How we can solve? So one is we call virtual carrier sensing. So which means that it actually sending some packet, okay? So what it does. Okay, you know, I want to send some packet to B. I'm the A, I want to send some packet to B. And what it send? It's sending certain, you know, packet that we call RTS. Okay, I want to send something to you. Okay, then I send it. Then, okay, when I send it, others also sense it. Oh, there are some other guys, you know, try to sending something. Already know others. But whoever that the destination that, oh, okay, oh, you can, you can send it. So it actually reply back, clear to send. Okay, you can send it. Now it's your turn, you send it. And then these guys will send it. But all, all the other guys, after seeing this CTS, they stop. Because they already know that one guy will sending something to that destination. So RTS and CTS. Okay, so this is a, some kind of you know, virtual sensing. 
So what happened is okay. If the sender sees CTS, sure, right? It transmits data because you know I want I just express I want to send it. Okay, the destination saying okay you are good to send it. Then transmit data. The other node see the CTS will idle for specific period of time, and then we'll try it again. Okay. But how, how about this case? Other nodes see RTS, but not CTS. Then they are actually free to send. Why this really solve this hidden terminal that you can see here? OK. And then another one is, OK, so here, so this, you know, even you see the RTS you, when you're sending it, you sending RTS, another node also can see RTS because RTS you are free to send it. So even you know some other you know you see some kind of RTS, you still can send some data to others. But CTS is not. Okay? And then so then you may have some question, right? Okay, clear to send so that I already sent it. Then how other node be you know sending some packet again? You may, you know, sending a lot, you know, very big, you know, data, right? Or very short. But other node doesn't know. So that's why the each packet, you know, RTS and CTS, even the data packet, has some specific field we call NAV, network allocation vector. So which actually includes the length of the, you know, their upcoming transmission. So that it knows, okay, when it sends this one RTS or data, it knows that when it will finish, okay? So that's why other hosts can chip in right after this, you know, the, the transmission is done, okay? Okay, so now let's see how that, you know, this is prevented. Okay, so A and C can see each other and then both send to B. So RTS can, RTS, CTS can help, right? So okay, both A and C sending RTS because they cannot see each other. So both of them sending RTS to B. And then B receiving two RTS packets, right? Based on its own algorithm, maybe first come first serve. Okay, A, you know, arrived first, okay, then you know, sending CTS, okay, A, you have a chance sending it. Then C detect, right? C detect CTS. Because B will sending CTS to A, and then that one also reaches to C. And the C know that, okay, so, oh, this CTS is not for me, so I'm not allowed. So it actually won't send. And then only this guy sent, right? Okay, this seems like a simple solution. That, uh, there are another problem that we call exposed terminal problem. So one is the hidden terminal is that, okay, the two hosts cannot sense it, but there are middle, you know, that, you, you know, that packet could collide, right? This one is exposed is because like this, okay? Sending it is okay. When you receive it, you have multiple, you cannot decode it, okay? So here, okay, so B actually sending something to A, and then C also sending to D. And then here, because the D, A, and D are not in the same range, so it actually can happen at the same time. But because of this range, right? Because carrier sense. Because of carrier sense, when B is sending something, because of this carrier sense, D cannot send anything. I mean, actually, C cannot send anything, right? So basically, you only have happened like you know, this happened, this happened, this happened, even though it can happen simultaneously. So this is hidden terminal. So here, okay, B sending to A, and then also C want to sending to D. But as you know, C received, C received B's packet, right? 
because B1 to sending it, because C is also in the range. So C will receive that one. Carrier says, oh, there is something going on. I stopped sending it. So that's why it cannot send it, even though it still can send and then D can receive it. So how we can solve? RTS, CTS, so virtual carrier sensing also works. Okay, so here, the situation. Okay, C hears RTS from B, right? Because B want to sending it. Okay, sending RTS, so it also arrived at the C. But what was the rule? If you use the C, you know, RTS, you still can send it, right? And then C knows that because, because this is RTS, you know, C knows that this wouldn't interfere, so it's actually sending to D. So that's why C is a send, you know, safe to send to D, okay? And then, you know, that when CTS, sure, you know, when it receives CTS, this will send it, right? Okay. So any questions? So there was uh, some question actually that I made it, but I hide it somehow. Here, let's try. Uh, yeah. So this is exactly the uh, midterm questions. So here, questions. When using RTS and CTS, what prevents a hidden terminal from covering the packet that another node is sending? Exactly that we just discussed, right? But there are actually very few answered correctly. There are a lot of people, they just, you know, confusing me and <laughs> <laughs> somehow, you know, all the different combinations, so it's actually, and then also, like, a, uh, even, it's hard to decode. You know, all very important, you know, this verb, they somehow like this, so, oh my God, and, even, and, and then I asked them to come and then explain it. And they actually couldn't explain, so. <laughs> so because of this, you know, the CTS, right? Because of CTS, then you basically can solve. And also expose terminal, and still you can send it, uh, even you see RTS, right? So that's why, you know, the uh, hidden terminal and exposed terminal problem uh, is solved. So then, Let's see. So impact on the higher layer protocols. So, okay, wireless and mobility, you know, changes, right? You move around and also the wireless signal that actually attenuate, right? So wireless, you know, you always have some kind of higher packet losses, even not from congestion. And the mobility also, there are some changes in round trip time and then also some transient uh, disruption happens, right? Then, and logically, right, this impact should be minimal. Uh, so because, you know, anyway, the best effort service, so IP is best effort, right? I will do my best. So basically, oh, yeah, sure, if there's a loss, sure, I will do my best. That logically, impact should be minimal. But the, if, you know, we have TCP or UDP, you know, run over, you know, wireless and things like that, but because of, you know, TCP, it has its own mechanism that we call congestion control mechanism that is designed for wired. Because what? Packet losses always because of the congestion. So that's why it, the adaptation is actually depending on, I mean, it's designed for wired. So if you just deploy it in the wireless, performance is really bad because you have, you know, the consistent packet losses. And then you think that this is because of congestion, so you keep, you know, lowering your throughput, even though you may need to increase your, you know, sending rate, right? So that's why the, there is some, uh, you know, performance is affected, because here, you know, one case that I mentioned, TCP always treat packet losses, you know, sign of congestion, so you always reduce, but that actually really bad for wireless because you may have some kind of you know random losses and you reduce it even though your wireless link has 100 meg you may achieve only one meg out of 100. Okay. So then oh wow it's a, this is a great area it looks like oh I found some good research topics. 
there have been a lot of papers for 15, 20 years. They propose some wireless, you know, TCP working under wireless networks. I improved the throughput two times, 10 times, 20 times. And even the company like Cisco or Bluecoat and a lot of some different companies, they actually made some proxy device that actually can improve under this situation. Okay, so they actually, you know, sold this kind of device for a long time. Okay. Okay, so now the conclusions. Yeah, I think it's a wireless. So already a major way to people to connect the internet, right? So, and as you know, that wireless, you know, unlike wired wireless, there could be frequent losses because of some physical error. So your uh, protocol also need to deal with uh, that situation. And also there is some mobility, the people moving around and also, the, when you design the network protocol, the, you have to you know, think about some different design choices. So wireless, you know, losses, prevalent, which means your protocol shouldn't be sensitive to these packet losses. Or you have to find some way to offset these losses from the, your entire connection. Okay? So any, any question? Okay, uh, thanks. Have a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs>